today on LA Currents. This council member grew up in LA and knows the importance of providing the community he serves with meaningful opportunities. Next, it's believed that stigma often comes from a lack of understanding or even fear. It can be subtle or obvious, but no matter the magnitude, it can lead to harm. We'll talk mental health with Dr. Laura Kokinda. But first, wildfires are a natural and unfortunate part of our landscape and over 4,000 fires were recorded this year. LA Fire Department Chief Ralph Terrazas discusses what we need to know and how to stay safe this fire season. A new report says that temperatures worldwide are up by one degree. It's wetter in the east and drier in the west. Here locally, our snowpack is down by 40% and we're into a second year of a severe drought. And so you know what that means for Los Angeles. Here to tell us how we can protect ourselves and make sure that everything goes well this fire season, I'm delighted to be joined by Fire Chief Ralph Teresa. The threat of fires here in SoCal, how bad is it really? Well, Maria, I wish I had some good news. It's, uh, it's going to be bad. It's been bad the last few years. And it's due to three main reasons primarily. It's the drought, which you just mentioned. It's climate change. And the third reason is people are moving into the wildland urban interface. So last year in the state of California, over 4 million acres were burned, which was double the previous record. So we're anticipating another busy year. And from what I understand, fire season has always been X amount of time and now it's longer. That's correct. Uh, the height of our brush season is usually September to I'd say January. That's when the Santa Ana winds are most common. But it has become a year-round threat. Uh, earlier in the year the fuels are still moist so it really doesn't get a chance to pick up steam and the Santa Anas aren't pushing it. So I, we count on putting it out with our initial uh, action uh, engine companies. And usually we do. Uh, it's when the Santa Ana's kick in and it's been dry and we haven't had rain for a long time, it rapidly spreads, then becomes a real challenge. Okay, so with all of this unfortunate information that everyone has been able to gather, and this is incredibly pertinent to you as fire chief, what is LAFD doing in order to help prepare for the worst as you keep your fingers crossed for the best? We uh, do this every year. We've been doing it for most of my career. I have 37 years now in the fire department. And um, we have annual training, refresher training for our chiefs and our captains. We have annual uh, fire company brush drills to keep uh, uh, refreshed on all the skills that you need. We also are always looking at new technology to get a head start on fighting these fires. We're very proud of our relationship with UC San Diego. We've initiated the uh, Wi-Fi uh, projection system, so we know within the first few minutes where that fire is going to travel to. Uh, in the last few years, we added another layer of technology. We call it the Firus. It's a fixed wing real-time intelligence system. What that is, two fixed wings uh, launch and they go above the helicopters, they fly the perimeter and they send down images to our dispatch center. And I get those images on my phone as well. They confirm the perimeter of the fire and that gets transmitted to the incident commanders on the ground. We serve that function for Southern California. We're the Southern California Wildfire Center here in Los Angeles. This year, we're going to have a greater number of cameras, the alert wildfire cameras. We have cameras throughout the Hollywood Hills and the Palisades and all other brush areas of the city. What have we learned in particular because of these technologies that you just mentioned about the behavior of fire? Are we getting better at understanding what it's going to do? I think we are. The um, Wi-Fi uh, utilizes uh, real-time weather information, known fire corridors, and it creates a projection. Uh, UC San Diego is a supercomputer center on the West Coast. So they can run through all these algorithms and they, they uh, shoot out a projection that gets sent to us at our dispatch center. Then literally, I can take a picture of the projection and then text it to all our field commanders. I also text it 
to the mayor and then whoever's council district it, that fire is in. So to answer your question, we have gotten better. Before, it was somebody's expertise who happened to be working that day mm -hmm. who would calculate what are the probabilities of, of this path of the fire. Now we have a consistent computer model that does it every day. Wow. Well, you can't protect people alone. You need actually to have those that our homeowners or just you know citizenry itself be aware and prepared so what are you hoping that homeowners will do prior to this fire season both you know in LA City proper and then just as these areas that you are talking about expand the, uh, the, the people that live in the brush areas are our partners in, in fire protection from a brush fire right. first of all they need to clear their brush 200 feet minimum that's the first thing we need our people to do. The second thing is to have an escape plan for your family. You never know where the brush fire is coming from, so have two ways to evacuate if you had to. And number three, I would sign up for alerts through the LAFD.org um, uh, software, excuse me, the LAFD.org website, mm -hmm. and you can uh, sign up for Notify LA by texting 888-777. And if, in fact, the worst happens and there is a fire, I imagine that the most important thing is you, know, you want people to do as they have been requested. Please evacuate when they're told. Please move your cars because they can make it a lot worse if they don't, correct? Absolutely. We also have a red flag no parking program. Uh, we implemented this after the Oakland Hills fire around the year 2000 because people were evacuating from their homes and clogging the streets. that maybe people won't think about and I'm just going to toss out some things and you can say if I'm right or wrong um, extra fire extra garden hoses you know attached around the house does that help you well if there's nothing else it, it, it is a help uh, our hoses are larger diameter and flow a lot more water but typically when uh, the system is being drained by multiple engines pulling water out of the hydrants the pressure is very low I see so depending on pressure if we have pressure and water we'll use our lines we can also draft from uh, swimming pools or lakes or the, or the ocean if we had to. Um, so we have alternative ways of getting water. But I would encourage people, if you have a hose, uh, to have it ready. Uh, those are, are rubber and of course they're gonna burn, but mm -hmm. sometimes you never know. It might be a tool that you may need. And also in terms of fire protection, um I was listening to some fire prevention things, just be incredibly cognizant and aware of things that you may be doing that cause a problem, like uh, towing something with a chain and a spark, whatever. I mean, what are some of the things that start a fire that you feel as if someone didn't do on purpose, but they were not um, aware enough to understand? There's also, there's the usual things. It's like uh, unattended campfire, discarding cigarettes, a few years back, we had somebody who was clearing brush with a weed whacker and they hit a rock, which created a spark, which started a brush fire. Um, that is so ironic Well, and terrible, but still. Well, there's been some uh, provisions now. If you do that, you have to have an extinguisher nearby. You have to have the ability to dial 911. And there's some things that the city learned from that. Um, so last year or the year before, somebody was driving in Northern California on a flat tire and that created sparks, it got into the brush and it created a large fire. So there's a lot of causes, but about well over 95% are human accidental starts. I was gonna ask you that because last year being a record year in California fires, what the percentage were of uh, human accidents, uh, acts of nature, lightning, and then the most horrific component, you know, literally arson people doing it on purpose so it's mostly just human error human accidental starts the northern california fires were last year primarily lightning strikes and uh, down power lines uh, when the wind gets to be a high speed it blows the lines and they break and they fall into the brush where they, they arc and then you have the the start of a fire Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Maria. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come visit with you uh, every time. Anita Bennett sits down with Councilmember Marquise Harris-Dawson to discuss urban planning, economic development, 
and the long-deserved changes coming to his district. Today we're talking about Council District 8. There are a lot of changes and new developments happening here. And joining me now to discuss this is Councilman Marquise Harris. Dawson, you represent this area. Thank you so much for joining us. It's good to be here. Thank you. We are actually in a park. You yeah, mentioned this we're park. In the port. We're in a park. Uh, parks are very important to us. We view our parks as ground zero for public safety efforts. It's where you can bring young people. It's where you can bring families. It's where we can be community. This pool was about to close, and so myself and the council and the mayor intervened, and so we're excited uh, that in just a few weeks we're going to open it up, and it'll be full of young people swimming from you know the break of dawn all the way until the sun goes down. Wow, what's been the reaction from the community about this park? The community is ecstatic. I think there have been a few kids who figured out how to jump the fence and test it out to make sure it's okay for everybody else. Uh, but I think, you know, the excitement is bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. And parks, you know, help keep kids off the streets, correct? That's right. It keeps kids occupied. It keeps them relationships with each other. And then when there are disputes, because young people, like adults, you're going to get into disputes. And so young people different than older uh, folks can be taught the process to settle a dispute that doesn't include violence. And you can learn that in a park, whether it's in your soccer league or in your little league baseball or your basketball league, or the dance class, or in the pool. Part of this park uh, was dedicated to a young woman who was killed right before the LA riots. Can you can you talk to me about so that? So Latasha Harlins tragically lost her life at Empire Liquor in 1991. Uh, this is the park that Latasha Harlins played in, and so recently, Reckon Parks, in cooperation with Latasha Harlins' family and Netflix, rebuilt the playground completely and we renamed the playground the Latasha Harlins Playground here at Algin Sutton Park. And I have to say the playground is lovely. So what about entertainment? Everyone loves to have fun. Any new projects coming to this well, area? Well, we're very excited because culture is so important to our district. We're very excited about Destination Crenshaw, which is really a cultural streetscape experience. will feature both fine art at the highest level of artists from uh, this community that are known all over the world. Uh, it will also feature performance venues so that local artists have a way of doing performances in the community. It's really tragic, I feel, that this part of the city is so much a driver of what is the entertainment capital of the world, the city of Los Angeles. Really, a lot of that fuel comes from this community, but our community doesn't benefit from it. And so Destination Crenshaw seeks to reverse that. And so it says, if you want to hear the music, if you want to consume the artwork, if you want to be entertained, you got to come to the place that birthed and nurtured that entertainment. And so whether it's Issa Rae and, and her television show, or Ava DuVernay or Kendrick Lamar, or whatever it is, it really comes from the heart of the black community of Los Angeles. And we want you to be able to consume it in the heart of the black community of Los Angeles. So let's shift gears now and talk public safety. What can we do to increase public safety? Well, the first and most important thing around public safety is just the sheer number of guns on the streets. You know, the press really covered the run on toilet paper during the pandemic. What they didn't cover was the run on guns. More guns were sold in 2020 than in any year that they've been keeping track. And because of uh, we're organized by states in this country, we have very good gun laws in California. They don't have such great gun laws in Arizona or Nevada or nearby states. So people can just go across the border, come back with the weapons. And what happens is you have an increase in shootings everywhere. So we got to deal with guns and we got to press the federal government to do something about the, the widespread availability of guns. I mean, young people can get a gun quicker than they can get an automobile in this city. And so you got to change that. But in the meantime, what we do is make sure that our public safety resources are very close to the ground. So that means we want officers that know the community, the community knows them, that they're embedded in the community, that they have a relationship with the community. We want gang intervention workers who have a history in the community that have been here for generations and have connections and know where the fault lines are, know where disputes are likely to pop up and help manage those you helped introduce a resolution to support the federal George Floyd Act. 
Tell us why you did that and what it's about. We did that because uh, we thought we wanted Los Angeles to be uh, one of the loudest in the course, demanding that Washington implement police reform. Uh, a lot of the reforms in the George Floyd uh, bill uh, have already been done here in Los Angeles, so there's nothing controversial for us per se, but we understand it's controversial for the nation because when you're a citizen and you go across this line or that line, a cop is a cop is a cop, and it hurts LAPD officers if officers down the road or in another state uh, behave in a, in a way that causes a decay in trust of law enforcement. Our officers end up dealing with that, whether they're the ones who did it or not. And so, you know, we got uh, um, 18,000 police departments in the United States. Most of them have less than 10 officers. And most of them, frankly, have very low, if, if any, standards at all, especially when you compare them to Los Angeles. This creates a national standard and it creates a national registry of police officers so that if you messed up in Missouri, you can't go to Texas and become an officer as if nothing happened. And so all those things we think are super, super important uh, to build the kind of fabric and relationship between police and the community that's needed. Mm -hmm. So the resolution is essentially to voice support for- For uh, that bill. Okay. And to ask our members of Congress that represent Los Angeles to make sure that they support that bill. Excellent. Um, are there any new developments, new projects happening in this district that you're excited about? There, you know, there's so many to count. There are too many to count. So we've got Destination Crenshaw along the Crenshaw line. It's a hundred million dollar outdoor uh, museum dedicated to the story of African Americans in Los Angeles and the West. Uh, we have this new pool and another new pool at Van Ness Park, uh, representing an almost fifty million dollar investment just in aquatics. Uh, facilities here in the 8th uh, uh, Council District. We've got the Western Beautiful Project, an $11 million renovation of the Western uh, streetscape. Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall, the, the, the subject of much discussion, sometimes heated discussion. It will be developed. It will be developed in our image for us uh, and for uh, the future of our community. And so there are really so many to count. Um, that I'm, I'm sure I left out a really, really important one. Uh, but the point is uh, the district is on the move. Mm -hmm. The summer jobs uh, program is very popular. Is it coming back this year? It is absolutely coming back. It'll come back with a vengeance. Uh, this is gonna be a great summer for the young people of Los Angeles. We expect their parks are gonna be fully staffed. We wanna get all these pools open. There's gonna be a full set of activities from Little League to to dance, to all of it that you see in the park. Uh, we want this to be like the golden era. When I was a kid and many, many of the members of the council who grew up in this town, when I was a kid in the summer, you could just walk to your local park or a local LAUSD campus. You didn't have to be a student, you didn't have to show a card. There were adults there. If you wanted to learn to play sports, you could do that. There were classes you could take. There were tournaments you could join. Uh, we want that type of environment back in Los Angeles for every young people that, that live uh, you know, from, from the top of Granada Hills all the way to the tip of San Pedro. All right. Is there anything else you're excited about in, in this district? We're, there's so much to be excited about it in, in the, the district, but what we're most excited about is I feel like we're really close to having a breakthrough citywide that's really going to help us deal with homelessness, that's going to help move people off the street into shelter and into housing. Uh, on a nightly basis and we're going to change the situation where we have come to expect as a regular course of business that our neighbors sleep outside at night. Um, in terms of the encampments that are say close to where people live, work and play, what is the community saying? Oh, the community is absolutely irate. Uh, they, people do not, you know, no one buys a house and says, oh, I want to have a campsite in the, you know, in my backyard or, or at my front gate. And so people are understandably irate. People, you know, are not hostile towards homeless people and they don't blame homeless people, but they do feel like the government has a responsibility to do something about it. And, you know, they hold our feet to the fire as they should. Is homelessness also a public safety issue? Homelessness is a public safety issue. It's a public health issue. But greater than both of those, it's a moral issue. History's gonna judge us. You, me, everybody. Oh, you were around when people were sleeping in the streets in Los Angeles and you lived there. What did you do? And we're all gonna have to give an account for that. Councilman Marquise Harris Dawson, thank you so much for joining us to discuss issues important to CD8. Next, she's a practicing psychologist specializing in mental health. Dr. Kokinda is here to help us understand the shame that can accompany a diagnosis, what that looks like, and how to address it.
Over 450 million people worldwide suffer from some sort of mental health issue. But there's still some sort of stigma attached to admitting that. Why? Well, we need to figure that out and we need to change it. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Laura Kakinda from LA's Medical Services to talk about this very real problem. Why is there such a stigma about admitting that you have some sort of mental health issue that could easily or maybe difficultly addressed, but you have to face up to it first. Well, you know, as I like to say, we all have our issues. So it's it's incredibly common. Everybody needs some help at times, but we, we don't like to ask for help. You know, people want to do things on their own and appear strong, which is understandable. However, like you said, help can really improve someone's life when we're struggling. Then there is that whole campaign of break the stigma. So, you know, a lot of it is, is sharing your stories in order to demonstrate that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that that is something that is incredibly important? Yes, especially in these current times, because one thing that I can attest to, you know, both personally and professionally, is that no matter who you are, this last year has has impacted you in, in some kind of way that's not been been the best. So we all need to focus on wellness and mental health now. So sharing our experiences will help us heal together, you know, and move forward in a positive way. All right, I'm gonna put you on the spot here mm -hmm. because you are, you know, a psychologist. So you see people via virtual, you know, yes. telehealth. Are you missing anything when that happens? Because we're live here together. Mm -hmm. I can see you, I can see your body language, you can see my body language. So are there things that you're worried about missing as a health professional when you're dealing with somebody during telemed? Or do you feel like you're really getting a good picture of what's going on? You know, in the beginning, to be honest, I was really concerned that we we're gonna miss some of that being in the same room. Because for me, I do think that's a benefit. However, what I found to be surprising is when you're doing therapy or treatment with someone in their home and in their environment there's benefits like um, one treatment for anxiety for someone that I, I was talking to a colleague who was treating someone who had some anxiety and part of the intervention involved moving some things around in the kitchen and that and they were able to do that during session which you know in a therapeutic room I might tell somebody here's your homework go home and work on this but if you're on you know, the tablet or the laptop, you can go right with that person to their kitchen, help them, help support them through what needs to be done, and that's actually a huge benefit. All right, so we have in our family what we call, you know, this whole time period has been a no judgment zone. Um, that no matter what, how someone handles this, you can't pass judgment because you can't, you know, feel what they're feeling and you don't understand. So that's kind of one of our little coping mechanisms. What do you suggest some other coping mechanisms that anyone can do? Um, I've had this conversation a lot recently and the thing that I think tops the list besides the no judgment, that's really awesome. It's very difficult, I'm sure, at times. But, yeah. You know, it's like, take yeah, you take that judgment and you, you just ride it out, you know. But the other thing is communication because if we can understand where people are coming from, you know, that helps, or at least reaching out. Like, I just had a conversation with someone who was saying, you know, we had this big family celebration time, and, you know, my friend invited all these people. I didn't feel comfortable inviting people, so now I'm worried people think that I didn't want them there, but it wasn't because I don't want them there. It's because I still i am not sure what's safe, and I wanted to err on the side of caution. So this individual is very worried about offending people, and, you know, the, one of the best things we can do is just reach out to the people you're worried that may have misunderstood or, or not been clear. So if you let them know where you're coming from and why, then at least that alleviates some of the stress from not knowing what people think your motivations were. If I was sitting in a professional setting with you and I admitted that I was going through some sort of um, perhaps depression, you know, I'm feeling lethargic and I can't move and everything like that. What are some of the things that you would tell me to attempt to do? What would be some of my homework to kind of get me to determine whether I need to pursue something further or whether this is just some little tiny thing I have to go through? So one thing is just to take an inventory of your routine. What's changed? What might you be able to add back in? And that's a good starting point to see if when you start to get back to what you used to do behaviorally, 
as your mood changing with that? So in regards to what's happened to all of us worldwide in the last year and a half, um, there is a very sensitive population who won't be able to have that self-awareness to understand mm -hmm. what has happened to them. And you're a mom, you understand this. So what are you looking for in your little guys? Because they're gonna, they've gone through this too. They've gone through a period of unknown. They've seen their authority figures be a little concerned. You know, they haven't had the access to their friends the way they had before. Their life has shifted and now it's shifting again. So what are you looking for in the health of young people and what should we be doing to assist them make it through this transition? Very good question. So depending on the, the age of your, your children or the young people who you care for, you want to, if they're able to have a conversation, you'll have open conversations with them. You can be direct and ask how they're doing. You can also share that you've been having a tough time, you know they've seen that, or they might have seen some news that was upsetting, and you can speak with them about that. It's good to be open to their developmental level. And then the younger kids, they just don't have the language to explain their feelings, so you look for behavioral shifts. If you're seeing you know, consistent behaviors that are not what you would expect from your kid, and it's not just a developmental thing, you know, I have a a toddler so there's moments where she's gonna act like a toddler but then there's sometimes where I can see oh she must be having a, a bit of a tougher day because this is above and beyond the norm so I'd want to address that then. Sleep has been a big part of this whole thing I mean how many people have you talked to that are sleeping too much or can't sleep at all or up in the middle of the night I mean seriously feel free to call me at 3 30 in the morning because <laughs> I'm gonna be up for a while I mean that just that what has happened with our sleep during this thing? Is that just a natural component of stress? It is. Um, also, it's just a, a period of change. Everyone's, a lot of people's schedules changed pretty suddenly. Commutes were different or non-existent, um, you know, and then people had a little more flexibility in their day and part of back to, you know, those lazy days or that unhealthy coping where they maybe took some days and did stuff that was really just not a normal behavior for them that throws off the sleep pattern. How much is physical activity mm -hmm. important for mental health? They're both so important for mental health. Your body, your mind, your emotions, they're all interconnected and if you improve one then everything gets better. If you let one lag or fall behind then everything kind of falls behind with that. So that's why it's an important important way to look at our wellness is a word that I like to use because that includes our, our mental state, our emotional state, our physical state. What about just people in our peripheral world, uh, perhaps not somebody super close, perhaps a neighbor, perhaps a colleague now that we might be going back into the workplace, you know, what should we be looking for in others and where's the line between, you know, crossing into someone's personal space and actually giving them some advice or some help that would make a huge difference? One thing is offer you know be mindful of how people appear if you know someone just went through something or if they're acting differently than they than you know them to be you know you can reach out and say hey I'm here if you need anything or how are you doing and then see how they respond if they really welcome that invitation to talk or or seem to want more then of course engage if they say okay thank you and and leave it at that then maybe give them some space because we all cope differently, we all want different support. How do you feel about social media and young people? Because there's actually a study saying that because the youth are growing up with this and they're able to compartmentalize it, it's like you know us growing up with television or the generation before us growing up with the radio, that it's not nearly as destructive as we, as adults who may not have had that access, um, felt to us. You know, it's interesting. I think we're going to have to to wait and see how that really continues to play out. It's, it does skew some perspectives and we have to keep an eye on it for sure, but hopefully that study is on to something. Yeah, that would be awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's always terrific to have you with us. Thanks so much for having me.